Hello everyone, it's Red Saber here from Saber C++ and today we're going to be creating this endless random side scroller where you're a ship trying to go towards the right and you have to dodge out of the way of the ships going towards the left. It's fairly easy to create and on the higher speeds it can be quite difficult. Let's get started. In the Arduino IDE, I'll hit this three dot menu and select new tab. I'm going to name our new tab sprites.h and it'll create a new file for us called sprites.h in a new tab. This is where we'll store the images for our game. Then at the top of the main file, I'm going to type hash include sprites.h to include that file and all of its contents. Then I'll go to piscolapp.com, which you can find at the link in the description, and create the actual images for our game. I'm going to resize the area to 32 by 16, and then I'll draw a sort of boat image, making sure the color is set to white, I'm going to leave some space at the back here so that we can draw what looks like a wake which will change over a few different frames so that it'll look like our boat is moving. So these little stair steps here that I'm creating will be the wake and I'll change them on each frame. First though I'm going to add some more detail to the actual boat. Then I'll duplicate this several times and each time I'm going to adjust what the wakes uh, look like. So we want the water to be moving away from the boat and out towards the end of the image over here. So each frame I'll get a little bit closer to that. Now I'll sort of break the wave off from the ship. And if we look up here, making sure the size is set to full, then we'll be able to see it kind of looks like the wake is coming out of the ship, which of course gives the idea that the ship is moving. Now we need to download these as a sprite sheet so that all six of the images are in the same image, and then we'll just split them. But we want to make sure that we set the columns to one, which will set the rows to six. Because the way our Arduino divides the images, it can't understand if there's multiple columns and multiple rows. It needs them all to be in the same column with the multiple rows. Then we're going to click the download button under the Sprite Sheet File Export category, which will download our image. Next, I'm going to go to the Image Converter, which you can also find in the description. And if I open up my file browser, then I'll be able to drag in the image, image I just downloaded from my Downloads folder. And as you can see, it's turned this into a bit of code that we can copy into our Arduino IDE. However, we need to change the name from New Piscal, potentially with a number after it, to Boat. And we also need to change the image size to 32 by 16, so it knows that there's six images here, which should be divided into 32 by 16. Then I'll go back to my sprites.h file and paste this in. I'd also like to create enemy boats, which need to be going the opposite direction. So if I go back to my file browser, then I can click rotate left twice, and now as you can see, the boats are facing the opposite direction. So once again, we can just drag our image onto the image converter, resize it to 32 by 16, and rename it to enemy. Then we can copy it into the Arduino IDE as well. We'll also need to hash include the arduboy2.h, which is the library for our Arduboy, and we'll need to create an Arduboy2 object called Arduboy to represent our console. In the setup function, we'll need to call arduboy.begin to initialize the Arduboy, arduboy.setFrameRate, and we'll set the frame rate to 60, and arduboy.clear to clear out anything that might have already been on the screen before we started this program. In the loop function, we'll need to check if not arduboy.nextFrame to make sure that we will return if the arduboy isn't ready for its next frame. Then for the actual code in our loop function, we'll start by running arduboy.clear, and then arduboy.pollButtons to get the values for all of the buttons. And then at the bottom, we'll run arduboy.display. In between these lines is where we'll run the actual code for our game, which will give us something to display based on the button input. The player is going to be able to switch between three lanes, the top, middle, and bottom. So we'll want a variable, which will be an integer. I'll call it boat row. And this will allow the player to be in lane 0, the top lane, lane 1, the middle lane, or lane 2, the bottom lane. Then we'll want an int called boat frame. And this will hold which frame the boat is on. So we'll be able to iterate over the six frames 
and show the boat on whichever frame is currently in this variable. And speaking of that, we'll actually need to have an int boat frames, which are set to six, that'll hold how many frames we have, so that when we get to the sixth frame, we can go back and start at the first frame once again. Then we'll need an int called boat frame time. And what this is going to do is be a delay in between the frame changing. So if I set this to 100, then it's going to delay for 100 milliseconds or a tenth of a second in between each time it changes the boat's frame. So we'll be changing the boat's frame at 10 frames per second. Of course, if we lower this, then it'll change the frame faster. Then we'll also need a long last frame change time to hold the last time we change the frame so that we can actually update the frame using this frame time variable. The last few variables we'll need will just be to help us out with positioning different player and enemy boats. So I'll create an int called row zero, which will hold the Y position of the zeroth row, which in this case is two, because it'll be two pixels from the top of the screen, so we have a little bit of a buffer. Then I'll create an int called row one, and this will be the top two, which is the buffer, plus the 16 pixels for row zero, plus five pixels in between the rows. So that'll be 23 pixels down. And lastly, the int row 2, which will be the 23 plus 5 for in between the rows and 16 for the rows. So that'll be 44. Inside of the loop function, after we pull the buttons, let's create a long called current time, and we'll set it to millis. This will mean that each time we want to check the current time, we don't have to do another call to millis. So it's more efficient for the program. Then let's call two functions, one called adjust frames, passing in the current time, and one called handle movement, which we'll use to position the player between the rows on whichever row they should be. It doesn't need the current time. Below this, we can create them. Uh, adjust frames will be a void, and it'll have one parameter along called current time. code for this should be pretty simple. So we want to check if the current time minus the last frame change time is greater than the boat frame time. So if it's time to change to another frame. And if it is, then we want to set the last frame change time to the current time. And we want to increase the boat frame by one. Of course, if the boat frame is greater than or equal to boat frames, so if we've maxed out the boat frame, then we want to set the boat frame back down to zero. Then we're going to create the void handle movement function, which doesn't have any parameters. And inside of it, the first thing we want to do is create a switch statement. And this will switch on the integer boat row. So we'll have different cases depending on which row we're in. So case zero will be the case that we're in the top row. And we'll want to actually draw the player's boat. So we'll run sprites colon colon draw over right to draw this over anything that might be in the background. And we'll draw it at four pixels from the left side of the screen. Row zero, we created this helper variable for that on the y-axis. We'll be drawing the boat, and we'll be drawing it at the boat frame, which we've already updated. Then we also want to check if the down button is pressed, and if it is, we'll want to move down a row. So if r2boy.just pressed, so we don't trigger this multiple times for one button press, down button, then we'll simply set the boat row to 1, and then we'll break. I'll simply copy all of this and create a case one, which will be the case for the middle row. Of course, we'll need to use the row one variable to get the y height. And if the down button is pressed, then we we'll want to change the boat row to two, because that's the bottom row. Then I'm going to change this to an else if statement so that we can create an if statement above and check if just pressed up button. So if the up button was just pressed, then we we'll want to set the boat row back to zero. So this will allow them to move down from the top row and up or down from the middle row. Then I'll paste in this one final time and we'll do a case two, which will have row two for the Y position. And we'll want to check if the up button is pressed and if it is, we will be moving them 
up to row 1. Now that we've added our player boat, let's try it out. As you can see, we can switch our player boat between the three lanes, and it has the wake animation that we created on the back there. Let's add an enemy for the player to avoid. At the top, let's start by creating an int enemy x, which will set to 128, which is the right side of the screen, because the enemies will start at the right and move to the left, and an enemy row, and we'll set this to 0. So the enemy will have an x value, which will decrease to move them towards the left, and a row value, which will change each time we spawn a new enemy. Then we'll have an int enemy move delay, and we'll set this to 10. So we'll actually decrease this to make the, play the enemies move faster and faster to make it more difficult, and an enemy movement that we'll set to 1. And, and this is a similar thing. We'll increase it to make the enemy move faster as time goes on. We'll also need a long last enemy move time so that we can use the enemy move delay. In the loop function, let's call a new function called handle enemy, and we'll need to pass the current time into this as well. Once again, I'll create this as a avoid function at the bottom of the program with a long called current time. And we'll want to start by checking if the boat has hit the player. So um, obviously we need to check if the boat row is equal to the enemy row, so if they're on the same row, and if the enemy x is less than or equal to 4 pixels, because that's where the player starts, plus 32 pixels, so 36 pixels, then they've gone past the front of the player's boat, and if the enemy x is greater than or equal to minus 32. So once the enemy goes fully off the screen, then we'll teleport them back to the right side of the screen so they can come in again, potentially on a different row. In a moment, we'll add some logic for ending the game right here, but for now, we won't do anything. So otherwise, if there hasn't been a collision, then we we'll want to check if the current time minus the last enemy move time is greater than enemy move delay. And if it is, then we'll want to set the last enemy move time to the current time, and we'll want to decrease the enemy x by whatever our enemy movement currently is. Then we need to draw the enemy, so we'll use the same a similar switch statement using the enemy row variable, and in case 0, we'll use the sprites colon colon draw over right to draw at enemy x and row 0, once again the helper variable we created up here, that's currently set to 2, and we'll want to draw the enemy sprite, and we still want the wake flowing animation to be playing for the enemy, but since we flipped the enemy around, the animation is actually backwards. So we need to say boat frames, the number of frames, minus boat frame. So this will flip it around, and then we need to subtract one more, because instead of going from 6 down to 1, we need to go from 5 down to 0, because the frames start at 0. So now we'll be effectively playing the animation backwards, but since we flipped the image backwards, it'll be playing the animation effectively forward. Then we'll need to have a break, and I'll do the same thing for case 1 and case 2, but of course using the row 1 and row 2 variables for the y-axis. Then, of course, as I mentioned before, we'll want to check if the enemy x is less than negative 32. So if the enemy has fully gone off the screen to the left, then we'll want to set the enemy back on the right side of the screen. So we'll set the enemy x equal to 128, and we'll decrease the enemy move delay. So enemy move delay minus minus. Then if the enemy move delay is less than or equal to 1, then what we want to do is we want to set the enemy movement to be increased by 1. And we we'll want to set the enemy move delay back up to 10. So the enemy speed will just keep increasing indefinitely. We'll decrease the number of milliseconds they have to wait from 10 all the way down to 1, and then once we've done that, we'll increase the number of pixels they move by 1, but put them back up to waiting 10 milliseconds once again. The last thing we need to do is set the row to a random value, so the, the enemy could be in any of the three rows. So first we'll seed our random number generator using the current time, and adding in a random value from 0 to just under a thousand, 
and then we'll set the enemy row to random 3. So it excludes this last number, in this case 3, so it'll give us either a 0 or a 1 or a 2, which are our 3 row options, just like up here. Except that these cases should actually be set to 1 and 2, so that we have a case 0, a case 1, and a case 2. Alright, let's try it out. And now we have enemies moving across the screen, and if we run into one of them, then it'll stop the game. However, we haven't yet set up an endgame or scoring, so the player doesn't know how well they did, and they can just move out of the way to continue the game. Let's fix that next. Before we do, if this video has been helpful to you so far, please give it a like. At the end of our variables, let's create a bool, game over, and an int score. In the setup function, let's call a start game function, which I'll go ahead and create right below that. This will be a void, and of course we don't have any parameters for it. The first thing we'll do is we'll set game over to false, and we'll set the score to zero. We'll set the boat row to 1, we'll set the enemy row to 1, we'll set the enemy x to 128 so that they're on the right side of the screen, and we'll set the enemy movement to 1 and the enemy move delay to 10. So we're resetting all of the variables to the things that we first initialized them as so that when the player runs the start game function, it'll restart the game. In the loop function, after the rdoboy.pull buttons function, and before anything else, we'll check if the game is over, and if it is, we'll want to run some different logic, and we'll return before running this logic. So what we want to do is we want to print out a sort of end screen. So the first thing we'll do is we'll run set text size, and we'll set the text size to 2, so we can print out game over really big. So I'll create a string called over text, and I'll set it to game over. You know what, let's do all caps, game over, with an exclamation point. So they know that the game is really, really over. Then we'll run set cursor, and we want to center this. So the center of the screen is 128 pixels divided by 2. And we want to subtract half of the length of this message. So the length of this message, the reason we created a string variable there, is because we can run over text dot length, which will give us the number of characters, and then we just need to multiply that by the width of each character, which is 12 pixels, because we're on size 2, and divide that by 2. So half of the characters will be before the center, and half will be after. Then on the y-axis, we'll do 64 divided by 2, because the screen is 64 pixels tall, and we'll subtract 16, because the characters are 16 pixels tall. So the bottom of each character would be touching the imaginary center line of the screen on the y-axis. Then the last thing we can do is actually run the print function and print out our over text. Then I'm going to copy this and do the same thing, except that we want to print out the player's score. So we'll print out a score with a colon and a space, and then we'll add to that the score, which we'll turn into a string using the string function. Pretty simple. And I'll rename this variable to score text there and in the other two places as well. And uh, this text should only be 1, so I'm going to set the text size back to 1, and this will mean that the width of the characters is only 6. Then instead of subtracting 16, we want this to be just a little below the center line, so I'll add 2. Mm, let's make it 4, just to make sure. Then I'll copy all of this and do it one more time because we need to tell the player that they can press A to restart the game. So once again, I'll rename the variable to press A text. And I'll set it to press A to restart. Then we'll want to change this to press A text and this to press A text. And this will still be size 1, so it'll still be 6 uh, pixels wide, but instead of adding 4, we want to add 14, so that it's fully beyond this line here. So our lines should stack up nicely and all be centered. We also need to check if just pressed A button. And if the A button was just pressed, then we'll want to restart the game using the start game function. 
And the last thing we need to do after we've checked to restart the game is run the display function to actually display all of these text things that we've created. Then, down in the handle enemy function, we can set game over to true when we check if there's been a collision. And at the very bottom, in this final if statement, we can increase the score if a boat has successfully passed the player. Now, let's try it out. And it works! Now we can move between the lanes, dodging the ships as they come, and if we crash into one of them, it'll tell us that the game is over, it'll give us our score, and it'll tell us we can press A to restart, which works just as it should. Hit the subscribe button below so you can continue to master the 8-bit and Arduino programming. Check out the video on the right to learn about another game you can make for the 8-bit or look at my channel on the left for lots of tutorials about other Arduino sensors, modules, and programming. Thanks for watching.